So here is the pseudo code for back propagation to a file. It just literally implements the procedure I just showed. Uh, we are initializing the derivatives to, uh, to uh, zero and then go back in time. So these are all initialized to zero. And then you go back to time. At each time for the output layer, you're assuming that you already have the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of the network, post multiplied with the Jacobian to get the output width, with respect to the affine term. Then compute the derivative for the weights to the output layer and increment because remember, the weights are the same in every column, right? So at every time, so you increment. Same thing with the bias. Then you can go back and get the derivative with respect to the output of the final hidden layer. Then you go back to the hidden layers. And at each hidden layer, first you compute that derivative with respect to the affine term by post multiplying the derivative with respect to the hidden value by the Jacobian. And then uh, you move, your, move backward and observe that you're going to get summations at, at various places. So this code is kind of foreshortened because things are things are uh, uh, initialized to zero, but you're actually going to get summations of multiple terms as you work your way back. And then finally, I have to verify this one. Uh, this, this looks dubious. But then finally, the derivatives with respect to the weights are again obtained exactly as up here. Note the plus sequence, right? So, so this, this pseudocode is literally just implementing what we have in this line. It may be a bug, I don't think so. So, and the procedure that we just saw can be generalized to any of these RNN structures. We'll see some specific cases in future lectures. Now, so far, we assume that the recurrence is strictly left to right from the start of time to the end of time. So we only model the dependence of the output at any time on the current and past inputs, right? But in many problems, the entire input sequence is available before you make your entries, like in machine translation. You see the entire English text before you translate it to French. Or if you're performing speech recognition, you're gonna see the entire input speech recording before you perform recognition. So in this case, it makes sense to not only model the dependence of the output at any time on the past inputs, but also on the future. Because if the past predicts the future, then the past can be deduced. When the past predicts the future, so the past can be deduced from the future, right? Say you're analyzing a sentence and the sentence is when Tom was young, he played baseball. If you're going left to right, when you see the word Tom, you know to expect the word he and not she. But if you go from the end to the beginning, from the backwards, when you see the word he, you know to expect that somewhere earlier in the sentence, there's a male name and not a female name, right? So you have both forward and backward predictability. And when your input, when you're in a situation where you can analyze the entire input before making your predictions, you can exploit this. And we do this by extending the RNN to capture both forward and uh, future and past dependencies. This idea was introduced originally by, by uh, Schuster and Hollywood back in the 90s, and that was the only way anybody works with uh, problems like speech recognition and machine translation. So how does this model actually work? Here's one block of a bidirectional recurrent network. The block takes an input, which is a sequence, and uh, which, which is an input series which could be either the input or it could be the output of a previous block, a previous layer. And then it produces an output, which is also a series, which could either go to the output layer or to the next block. Within the block, there are two distinct components. One is a forward net and one is a backward net. 
the forward net processes the input from the beginning to the end. The backward net processes the series from the end back to the beginning. So here is the forward net. It recurrently processes the input left to right from t equals zero to the last final time instant. And it outputs a series of hidden state values. The forward net itself is going to have this initial value h of minus one. So the forward net outputs a series of forward hidden states, which are indexed so represented by this subscript x. And here is the backward net. The backward net processes the input data in reverse from the beginning, from the end to the beginning. So to be clear, this is not the backward pass or backdrop. Rather, we are recurrently processing the input, but backwards in time. Yes, Sami, that's a question. Uh, so I wanted to understand now, like how would uh, we calculate like divergence in this case when we're going backward and forward, like how would that work? Okay, so let's get to that, okay? So we'll get to that in a few slides. But the point is this backward model, again, this backward model now has an initial value, which is this HB infinity. I'm, I'm tagging it as infinity, which basically means this is the initial value for the backward recursion. This is also another important parameter of the network, which could be large. The backward recursion is going to produce these backward hidden states. Now, the forward and the backward hidden states at each time, right? so you have these two individual blocks. This backward hidden state produces some values. The forward hidden, the, for the backward recursion produces a backward hidden state. The forward recursion produces a forward recursion of a hidden state. And these two are combined to produce the overall output of the block. So, and typically the combination is done just by concatenation. You concat con con concatenate the forward, forward and backward hidden values, but you can do other things like maybe adding them, right? But I'm going to assume concatenation. So, uh, Thus, this entire block, including one forward recursion and one backward recursion, produces one sequence of hidden states. And so uh, the complete bidirectional network is going to look like this. It's going to have a collection of such blocks. You would have an entire sequence of inputs. And then uh, in a model of like the one to the left, the sequence of inputs is going to be analyzed by a bidirectional block which produces a sequence of hidden state values. Then another bidirectional block operates on these guys and produces another sequence of hidden state values and so on through the net. And then the hidden state values produced by the final block are processed by the output layer, you know, the output layer to produce the sequence of outputs. Or you can have something simpler where the forward and backward recursion itself is is performed by a sequence of, uh, by uh, a multi-layer network. So here you have a complete multi-layer network doing the backward recursion and a complete multi-layer network doing the forward recursion. Now, or you can have any kind of combination, it doesn't matter. But this picture sort of tells you how you can get the sequence, output sequence using the bidirectional recursion, each block processes the input using both forward and backward recursions to produce, this, produce its seven state values. And when you get to the final layer, which could be bidirectional, the sequence of outputs produced by the bi final layer goes into the, uh, goes into the output layers to produce the sequence of outputs. So is this making sense to everybody? Guys? I'm assuming yes. So now I have some pseudocode. 
take a look at it. I'm skipping that. For the gradient computation by back propagation, as usual, we're going to perform the, 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 the inference pass first. And the inference pass is going on the training day, the training instance. It's going to perform both the forward and backward recursion. Then for the backdrop, I'm going to assume, remember, for the backdrop, when I pass the data to the entire network, I'm going to get a sequence of values out here. And so I'm going to assume that I can compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to these y values. And therefore, the derivatives of the divergences at the for the sequence of outputs by the block. So we will assume that we already have the derivatives out here. And given the derivatives out here, we want to compute the derivatives for the parameters inside the network. And then we want to compute the derivatives out here. These are the two things. We must compute. So uh, now, if the hidden state value here is obtained by concatenating these two guys, then the hidden state here, if this one is, if this hidden value say dimension n, and if this hidden value say dimension n, then the concatenated value is going to have dimension n plus n. The derivative is also going to have dimension n plus n. So I can take the first n values and pass it back here, the second n values and pass it here. And so now I'm going to have the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the outputs of both the forward and the backward networks by separating these derivatives into the forward and backward components. And so now we have the derivatives out here as well as the derivatives out here. The rest is easy. Now for the forward net, I already have the derivatives here, right, at all of these locations. So now I can just use backdrop and compute the derivatives with respect to all of the parameters using just the regular um, back propagation through time to this, to this forward recursion. And I can also compute the derivatives with respect to the input to the forward recursion. This is just straightforward BPTT, right? Now for the backward recursion, we're going to do the same thing, except now that when you perform backdrop, the backdrop is going to go in this direction. And this backdrop, you already have the derivatives at each of these locations. So you can back propagate the derivatives in reverse time or in, in, in this time in forward time. And that will give you the derivatives with respect to all of the parameters of the backward network. And that is also going to give you an independent set of derivatives with respect to the input to the backward recursion. And now, because the entire bidirectional block used uh, you know, both the forward and the backward recursions of the bidirectional block, use the derivatives with respect to the inputs, and both the forward and the backward recursion gave you derivatives with respect to the input to the block, those two must be added to get you the final derivative of the divergence with respect to these xt types. And once you have those, you know, and again, keep in mind that this XT doesn't have to be the input to the network. It can just be the output of the previous block in the bidirectional network. And now once you have those, you can propagate those further back and continue your, continue your back propagation. So did this bit make sense to you guys? You're kind of done. I mean, I uh, sort of made this a little too concise maybe, but did this make sense to you guys? Yes or no? Somebody say yes. Okay. I'm assuming, I'm assuming. Yes. All right. And so, and now you can train your net, right? Because you've got the derivatives with respect to all the weights, all the biases, everything. And you can just insert it in, they can just. 
And so the story so far, time series analysis must consider past inputs along with current input. Record networks look into the infinite past through our state space framework. Training recurrent networks requires defining a divergence between the actual and desired output sequences, back propagating gradients, and the training further requires back propagating gradients over the entire chain of recursion, which is BPTT, followed by pooling of gradients with respect to the individual parameters over time, which is why you have the plus sequence. If you have bi directional networks, they analyze the data both ways both from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning to make predictions. And these networks, back propagation must follow the chain of recursion and gradient pooling separately in the forward and reverse nets. And the forward net, back propagation is going to go from the end to the beginning. The reverse net, back propagation is going to go from the beginning to the end. And then you complete your derivatives. So in summary, RNNs are excellent models for analyzing series data for time for uh, time series prediction, time series classification, sequence division, and so on. Uh, and we've sort of seen how these things can be set up and sort of briefly gone over how back, back propagation can be performed. Now, remember, I began the lecture by showing some examples of sequences generated by RNN. And nothing we've seen so far tells us how to use RNNs to generate sequences. We just saw uh, how you can make predictions with the recurrent networks. We'll see how you can make, how you can generate data in a later lecture. So in closing, RNNs are great for all of these series analysis tasks. But as we will see in the next class, they can also simplify some static non-series data problems that are difficult for multi-layer processing. So they actually end up, it turns out that they, that they are very versatile. I'll stop right here. Thank you for your patience.